All right. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, any questions? So there is a question somewhere. Here. Yeah. Uh, you you have you have to figure that out. So uh, the hint is uh, the same way the same process that you applied uh, to set up a least squared solution for affine, uh, you do that for projective also. So in projective, if you write x prime is equal to, so you get a, a denominator and a numerator term, right? Because there is a division happening. Uh, so multiply the denominator here. And then rearrange all the terms which have a's in them on one side and which don't have a's in them on the other side. And that then write it as a matrix. Okay? All right. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, today we want to start our discussion on uh, camera models, uh, which, is, uh, which is really a, a fundamental part of this course uh, because. Uh, uh, because uh, I mean this is computer vision right <laughs> and, and computer vision means we want to understand the images uh, taken by a camera in the same perceptual way as humans understand it uh, the images that they take to, through their eyes right so um, uh, so therefore it is important that we understand uh, we have a representation of a camera uh, in a mathematical way uh, we, we, we are able to uh, to understand the imaging process, okay? Uh, so this is module two of the course. Uh, we have covered some of the preliminary mathematics that we needed uh, to try to do the rest of the stuff in this course, all right? Okay, uh, so uh, w the camera that we'll discuss is not a very com complicated camera. We'll, we'll, we'll just limit ourselves to the camera model of a pinhole camera, which is a really simple, uh, straightforward device. There are many, uh, there are many more complicated camera models than this. Uh, some of them you might have studied in uh, really physics where you have the thin lens equation, one over u plus one over v is equal to one over f type of equation, right? Uh, but, but we are not gonna, we are not gonna deal with lenses. Uh, so we'll just study pinhole cameras. And in fact, uh, the, lens, the lens assembly in, in let's say an SLR camera is there to mimic a pinhole camera in certain ways. Uh, a pinhole camera has certain limitations. Uh, the pinhole, for it to be effective, has to be very small. If it is very small, very low amount of light will go into it. If low amount of light goes into it, you need a very sensitive film. You can't take, you can't take pictures in dark light and so on. So then, to be able to do that, you have to increase the size of the pinhole uh, to get more light in. As soon as you increase the size of the pinhole, you have blurring because there are many light rays which can, there are many parts of light rays which can go inside. When that happens, then you put a lens assembly to undo that blurring while keeping the aperture size large, okay? So, so in a sense, it's not a bad thing that we are studying a pinhole model, even though there is some need to study lens physics in certain problems, uh, but, but as far as we are concerned in computer vision, we are okay with the pinhole model. Now, the pinhole camera was invented, it was first described by a famous uh, Muslim physicist and scientist, uh, Ibn al-Khaytham. Um, uh, he really was an amazing person. He lived about a, uh, about a thousand years ago. Uh, he, uh, Abu Ali al-Hassan bin al-Hassan bin al-Khaytham. Uh, he, uh, he has many, many contributions uh, to physics and to philosophy. And in fact, he is now, he is now being recognized as the founder of the scientific method. Uh, the scientific method means that okay, we will uh, we will we will do experiments, and our experiments should be replicable, and and based on the evidence of those experiments, we'll draw conclusions, right? Uh, he was kind of the first one to formally describe that in his text because uh, because uh, uh, some of the knowledge was coming from the Greeks, and, and he wrote uh, that we will evaluate that knowledge on the merit of its evidence and not on the fact that it came from some great scholar. Uh, so, so he said, uh, uh, there is taqlid in religion, but not in, in these matters. And so he differed, he differed from some uh, famous Greek scientists, and, uh, and people criticized him for that, and then he wrote this. And, and people say that that's the first, uh, uh, first exposition of the scientific method in a way. 
Okay, so he has a lot of contributions. Uh, <coughs> so what happened was, uh, just as a matter of history, uh, uh, the uh, the ruler or the governor of uh, Egypt wanted to make a dam, and uh, and he asked, uh, he called Ibn al Haytham there to to decide on the location of the dam, uh, and Ibn al Haytham selected he he surveyed the areas and he selected the region where where we now have the Aswan Dam, uh, it's one of the big dams in Egypt. Uh, so he selected that location; it was suitable for the construction of a dam. Uh, but the ruler did not like that because he was trying to favor another location somehow. Uh, and so Ibn al-Haytham was afraid that, that he would be upset with him, so he feigned madness. He, he said, like, I've, I've, I've like gone crazy and, and did, like, did like crazy things. And so the, they put him under house arrest uh, in a way that he's mad, we won't put him to jail or something, we'll, we'll just confine him to his house. And he stayed there, and that's where he wrote this famous book, Kitab al uh which was a seven-volume book on optics. And it's now available in English. Um, uh, the original Arabic is also available, but it was translated from Arabic to Latin uh, uh, during the European Renaissance period, so that it was taught as a textbook in European universities till actually very recently, till about 100 years ago, it was considered the fundamental text on optics. Uh, in a way, like 150 years ago or 200 years ago, till that time it was considered a fundamental text on optics. Uh, so, uh, so some translations from the Latin texts are available in English, and and and, and you can look it up. Uh, even though the original Arabic has also now possibly been translated, I think uh, it's a very interesting book because because he he deals with a range of topics re related to optics in this book. Uh, he, he dissects the human eye and, and, and describes its structure, uh, the structure of the retina and the cornea and the lens uh, there. Um, then he describes the optic nerve. In, interestingly, he did not understand that it's an electrical signal, so he described the optic nerve as a, as a hollow tube which can carry light, kind of like fiber optics, right? He, he thought it was like that. Uh, he, he then was the first to postulate that, uh, that uh, perception is not just an action of the human eye, uh, but there is some processing happening in the brain. Uh, per human perception is a combined action of uh, the eye and the brain. He described the pinhole camera. He described many other uh, optical phenomena in this book related to lenses and convergence of, con con uh, convergence of light rays and so on. Uh, he also... Um, uh, so, so there are many, uh, there are many contributions uh, that that this textbook has, and that's why it was considered such a fundamental text uh, for maybe 800 years. It, it was taught as a fundamental book on uh, on on optics. Uh, and one of the things that he describes in this book is obviously the pinhole camera. Uh, he he caught it. Uh, he called it Bayt al Muslim. Bayt is a, is a is a house or a room. Uh, and Muslim uh, zalama, that's from darkness, right? We, we say zul, which is darkness. So he said, Bayt al-Muslim, which is the dark room or the dark chamber, uh, which was translated into Latin as camera obscura, because camera, the etymology of camera is that it, it's a chamber or a, or a room or an arched room or something like that. Uh, so they, uh, and obscura for dark. So, so they translated it when, when his Arabic was, uh, word was translated into uh, Latin, they translated it as camera obscura. And that's where we have the word camera from. So, so literally the word camera comes from his work uh, as a translation uh, of his work, okay? Um, uh, so this is an illustration from somewhere describing his, uh, uh, describing his construction where he has a hole in this window uh, and he can see a scene and, and that scene is projected upside down here. Uh, uh, and he described this construction. Uh, the first photograph from an actual camera which was recorded uh, is uh, by Nesipi, Nes uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Nesifor Nesipi in France, uh, 1826. So that's the time when uh, people realized that they can have a photosensitive chemical uh, which will change its color uh, according to the amount of light that it's exposed to. Uh, so it's not much of a photograph, I mean it's hard to see. Uh, well, our projector is not good, so there's a drawing here uh, on this slide uh, which sketches out it, this is a roof and that's a building and so on. This photograph was exposed for about eight hours 
to to take this uh, to take this photograph, and that's where uh, photography started from. Uh, and and ever since the the process was rapidly improved, uh, so that you don't have to do an eight-hour exposure to capture something on film. Uh, better chemicals were invented, and so on. And then uh, and then a video came about. Uh, Edward Moybridge he started doing lots of still photographs in a sequence uh, uh, around I think 1870s or 1880s, uh, and that came video. And then uh, then there's a whole progression for that. Okay. All right, uh, so what is a pinhole camera? A pinhole camera is based on a very simple principle uh, that light travels in straight lines. The, uh, the aperture here or the pinhole uh, is infinitesimally small. We can assume it to be a single point. Well, obviously, in practically, it's not infinitesimally small, but we try to make a small hole there. Uh, the, the smaller this hole is, the less blurring you will get in your image, right? Because there will be less parallel paths for light to reach those uh, points uh, uh, and and therefore it has an infinite depth of field uh, depth of field is uh, in, in terms of cameras we say depth of field is that portion of the world in front of the camera which is in focus which will appear uh, sharp okay so if the aperture is large then things will get blurred then you have to put a lens in front of it and the lens can't make everything in focus uh, perfectly uh, so what the lens has to do is is decide on which region you want to focus on, and that region is is sharp, and the one before it is uh, not sharp, and the one after it is not sharp. But that's not the case in a pinhole camera, so we don't really have to talk about focus in a pinhole camera because the depth of field is infinite in front of the camera uh, if the pinhole is really small. Okay, uh, so that's the construction of a pinhole camera. Everyone should try it once in their life. It's it's pretty cool to be able to see. Uh, images uh, live projected. Uh, take take like a take like a Pringles box. That's ideal for making it because the lid is translucent. Translucent, right? Um, the small Pringle box is okay. The large one will give you uh, uh, the focal length becomes too large, so the images become very small. So the small Pringle box is okay. Uh, but the image is so dim that to be able to see it, you have to have some darkness around you. So uh, so I, when I was in like fifth grade or sixth grade, I I took a, I had a black jacket, my elder brother had a black jacket and I put it on top of me and then through the neck I, I stuck this and, and then, then you can walk around and, uh, and you can see really good color images actually, right, on, on the lid of the, uh, of the Pringles box. Um, uh, but they're just upside down, so don't bang into something, <laughs> right, because, because the images are upside down. In fact, that's an interesting point. Uh, um, Human perception, human brain is, uh, uh, is, is amazing and it's not fully understood and there are lots and lots of amazing uh, learning processes going on in there. Uh, so in one of the psychology experiments, uh, human perception experiments, uh, they made a person wear glasses uh, which just inverted everything. So, so, so the guy saw everything upside down. Okay, and then he was supposed to, as a test experiment, he, he had to wear those glasses throughout 24-7, not, not take them off. So he just saw the world upside down. And in a few days, uh, the brain kind of rewired itself, and now he could see things the right side up. Uh, it shows you that perception is an action in the brain. It's not, it's not uh, just the eyeballs, not just the optics of the camera itself. Uh, and then after like maybe seven days, they had him take off the glasses and then he saw everything upside down. Right? Uh, I mean, a lot of people are like that. They can't see your viewpoint and they think everything is, <laughs> is upside down. Uh, so, so, I mean, this guy without the glasses was seeing the world upside down. Uh, and then it, again, it took a few days for him to, for the brain to rewire itself and, 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 uh, and get things the right side up. Uh, we see that in robotics, for example, when, when people do prosthet, uh, uh, interfacing with uh, prosthetic limbs, uh, they don't have to precisely calibrate the signal on the nerves with the actuators uh, because they just do the interface in the correct way. Let's say it's a frequency modulated signal, so they just do a frequency modulation decoding. And then in the beginning, the guy wants it to go this way and it goes that way. But in a few days, the brain rewires itself based on feedback that you are getting from your eyes and so on, uh, the, the signals on the nerve recalibrate themselves so that the person can grip things. So the brain has this amazing capability uh, to learn and to uh, 
uh, to adapt to different uh, stimuli. Okay, and that's what uh, happens in a uh, in in this perception experiment that I should uh, that I described now. Okay, uh, so uh, there are some there are some properties for pinhole camera. The fundamental property that we are interested in, in fact, all the mathematics that we will talk about derives from this simple property uh, that in a pinhole camera straight lines will map to straight lines, which means straight lines in an image, uh, straight lines in the world will map to straight lines in an image. Okay, and, and that's kind of easy to easy to understand because because the light rays travel in straight lines okay so since light travels in straight lines in fact that's the fundamental axiom here for the pinhole camera all the mathematics will be derived from that since light travels in straight lines so therefore straight lines in the world will map to straight lines in the image okay and that, that's really just one simple property that's it we'll, we'll start from here uh, and 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 this leads to all the mathematics that that we have to uh, work with. Uh, so straight line maps to straight lines, uh, polygons map to polygons, uh, parallel lines meet. Uh, so here we have an illustration. These two lines are parallel in the world in this ground plane, uh, but because they are joined to this center of projection, uh, we we get parallel lines to meet. We'll 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 see this mathematically also. Um, uh, you are familiar with this phenomena in photographs, right? So uh, another property of uh, pinhole camera is this, uh, what we call perspective foreshortening. Uh, things which are far away get smaller in size in projection, okay? And that also follows from the simple property that, straight, that light travels in straight lines. So if I have an object this high, uh, it will appear in the image like this, right? Uh, if I have the same object, the same height object, but far away, it will appear in the object in a smaller size. Okay, so as objects, as, th as distance from the camera increases, uh, things get smaller and smaller. And again, something we are familiar with, uh, the moon is a very large object, uh, but, uh, but we see it the size of a pebble, uh, because the pebble is close to us and the moon is really far away, right? Uh, so, uh, so here in this picture, uh, these two persons are roughly the same size, but in terms of the height in pixels, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, significantly different. All right. Uh, so uh, let's describe some, uh, some axes and structure and mathematics for, uh, for the pinhole camera because uh, we, we, want to, we want to describe it mathematically. Uh, so the pinhole is considered, it's also called the center of projection or the camera center or the optical center. Those are all names for the pinhole, okay? Uh, in, in case of our eye, uh, we, we have a lens under the cornea uh, uh, and, and the center of that lens you can approximate as the pinhole, okay? Uh, uh, let the center of projection, which is, which means, uh, let the center of projection, which means the camera center of the pinhole, I'm gonna fix an axis at that location for now, okay? So the world Euclidean axis, x, y, and z, which is an R3 space, okay, is located here. So I have x, y, and z going out, and again, I've, I've been careful to create a right-handed system here, okay? So that's where I'll define my world to be, and z is going out in the direction of the optical axis of the camera. So the plane z is equal to f, this plane, because this is, we call this focal length, the distance from the pinhole to the imaging plane, we call that focal length, uh, which is z is equal to f. Uh, so this is the imaging plane or the focal plane. Okay. In fact, in fact, uh, correctly speaking, I should say z is equal to minus f because z is going that way. So I should really call it z is equal to minus f. But as we'll see in just a moment, uh, that doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, so this is the imaging plane or the focal plane, and then the line from the camera center which hits the imaging plane perpendicularly, which is really the z-axis right now because it hits the imaging plane per, uh, at a perpendicular and it's passing through the camera center. That's called the optical axis or the principal axis or the principal ray. Okay, it's like, it's like the, the perpendicular to your image, to your film, the ray going through the pinhole out into the world, uh, which I've defined here as the z-axis. Okay, 
so, so the, here's some terminology, center of projection, camera center or optical center, which is the pinhole, uh, imaging plane or the focal plane, which is really your film, okay, or CCD array, or wherever you are creating the image, and the principal axis or the principal ray, or, or we also call it the optical axis, is the ray coming out of the film, perpendicular to the film, so it's the normal of the film, but that normal which passes through the pinhole. The pinhole we will mathematically consider as infinitesimally small, so it's a single point, at least as a mathematical construct. When you make a physical camera, of course it has some finite diameter, uh, but here we'll consider it as a single point. All right? Okay, any, any questions on terminology here? Okay, so, so, so I'm going to develop the mathematics of the pinhole camera in, in its canonical configuration. By canonical configuration, we use this term a lot uh, in this course. Uh, we will use it a lot in this course. By canonical configuration, I mean the standard configuration. The standard configuration here is that the camera is located at the origin. So the pinhole is at the origin with x-axis going this way, y-axis going this way, z-axis going that way, right? So, so I've defined a standard configuration. Of course, in reality, a camera can be anywhere in the world. So, so, so it will not always be in its canonical configuration, okay? But I will, I will assume it for now to be in its canonical configuration and then I will later derive the transforms of when it is not in the canonical configuration what the mathematics would be. It's kind of the same as, uh, uh, kind of like when I was deriving rotations yesterday. I said, okay, first let me derive about the axis because that's simpler. And then later I generalize it to about an arbitrary axis. The same strategy we'll do here. We'll first do a simple case and then just generalize it to more complicated cases. Okay? All right. So there's a camera center C, uh, which is at the Euclidean origin. Uh, the principal axis is aligned with the Z axis. That's the canonical configuration. The principal point P. So that's a new term I'm using here. The principal point is the point where the principal axis cuts the image, imaging plane. So the principal axis is going through the pinhole perpendicular to the film, so where it hits the film, that's the principal point. It's kind of like the center of the image uh, for you in some way, okay? All the other rays will hit the film at non-orthogonal angles. There is one which will hit the film at exactly an orthogonal angle, the imaging plane at an orthogonal angle. So we call that the principal point. And the imaging plane is often taken by convention to be in front of the camera. That's why I actually wrote in the previous slide Z is equal to F rather than Z minus F. See what happens is that all rays pass through the pinhole. And so the image will, so the world is here, I'm, I'm looking that way, the image will be inverted, okay? And it's inverted and it's F behind the, the, the camera. That's how a physical camera is. Uh, but to avoid this inversion, which just introduces a negative sign in your, in your mathematics because things going up will be th things going down there. What I can assume that there is a virtual fil film in front of the camera, which is exactly F distance away. And if that's the case, it's, it's not really there, but I can just mathematically assume it to be there. If that's the case, everything will be upright on that film. Still, everything is joining to the pinhole. All the rays join to the pinhole, but, but things will be upright on that virtual imaging plane, okay? And so that's why I could say the imaging plane is really at Z is equal to F rather than minus F, and I can avoid the minus sign in, in all my mathematics. And I, I can avoid the fact that things are really inverted, okay? Uh, so, so that's a convention which is often used. That's why in this figure, I have the camera center here, but the film is not behind the camera center, it's in front of it, uh, which is not how a physical camera is, but it's mathematically equivalent. Uh, I, I'm saying, I'm saying that the construction of the camera is like this. You have the camera and you have a hole here, okay? And this is your principal axis. So this is how the imaging process happens. Uh, this is how the imaging process happens, right? So the image will be this thing, okay? Instead of thinking that this is the imaging plane, I'll think that this is the imaging plane where this distance is f, so this distance is also f, okay? Now, now I will still join the ray to the camera center to find where the image is. But I'll say the image is here, which is exactly the inverse of that. I mean, the negative of that. And in this case, image will appear upright if for an upright object, which is slightly more convenient in mathematically, and so that's what we commonly use. Yeah. 
no, I, I assume this plane to be at the same distance so that I get the same height of the object that I would get there. Otherwise, otherwise the height would not be the same, right? Okay, so uh, here I'm, I'm showing both the configurations. I mean, this is how I first drew it, inverted image, and this is the upright image. And so let's, let's now mathematically <coughs> look at this because we understand what's a pinhole camera, so let's now mathematically look at this. So this is gonna map the camera, by definition, a camera is a mapping from a three space to a two space. So it's a, uh, it's a mapping from the world, three dimensional space X, Y, Z, to an image space X, Y. And, and like before, wherever I write capital letters, uh, those, de those donate world coordinates. And then wherever I write small case letters, those donate image, image coordinates, okay? So now, by similar triangles, you can see, so Z is the distance of how far away this object is. I'm just looking at one cut of my imaging geometry, okay? So this, oh, uh, so Y, Y over Z is the same as this small y over F by similar triangles, right? Uh, the ratio remains the same. Agreed? So, uh, all right, and, and in fact, this fact follows from the fact that triangles are made from straight lines and so, so these ratios are maintained. Uh, so, so I really said that all of the mathematics that we do for cameras derives from this fact that light travels in straight lines and so straight lines map to straight lines. Okay, so, so this relationship is actually relating, it's a very simple relationship, but it's actually relating your world coordinates, Y and Z in this case, to your image coordinate Y through a parameter which is a parameter of the camera F. That's, that's how far away the, the imaging plane is from the pinhole, so it's a, it's, a cam, it's a camera construction parameter, it's embedded inside the camera. Okay, and I can just rearrange this, so I can say the image coordinate, so given world coordinates and the camera parameter, I can compute the image coordinate. I can compute that Y, small y, is F times cap Y over Z. Okay, and in fact, in fact, this equation tells you why things get smaller, because as Z increases, because Z is in denominator, this, this thing gets smaller, which is what we expect it to be, the foreshortening effect, yes. Uh, okay, so so the the same equation for x, right? Because because this the camera was sitting like this. I I cut it like this to see this geometry. Now I will cut it like this, and it will have the same geometry, the same similar triangle geometry. Okay, uh, if I, here I'm looking in the y z plane, then I can look in the x z plane, and I get a similar triangle there, a similar similar triangle there, right? The first similar is the English similar, and the second is the math similar. <laughs> okay, so so I get uh, I get uh, x is equal to f x over z. Uh, if I was not doing it like a virtual plane, I would need to have a minus sign here, a minus f over z. If I was talking about the inver inverted to to say that it's going the other way, but that's what the virtual plane helps us to do. The virtual image plane helps us to do. I just get rid of that minus sign, so it's more convenient. Okay. All right, so therefore, what is a camera? This is, this is like a definition of a camera, a, a pinhole camera. A camera is a device or a construct which maps X, Y, Z transpose into F, X over Z, F, Y over Z. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a mapping from R3 to R2, which is essentially what a camera is. It's a projection device that maps from R3 to R2, okay? All right, uh, we, we also call this central projection. Uh, uh, just because uh, the optical axis hits the, Im the point where the optical axis hits the image plane uh, vertic uh, orthogonally is at the center of the image. There are oblique projections in drawing and so on. We are not talking about that. So the same thing is also called central projection. And now, uh, since we like ma matrices in this course, Right, everything we try to do, we try to write it as a matrix equation. So the same thing that I wrote on the previous slide, I'm gonna to try to write it as a homogeneous system in matrix form, okay? And my claim is that, well, this is the way to write it. This is the input vector, x, y, z, one. It was really in R3, now I'm writing it in P3, right? So I extend it by one. And this is a three by four matrix, which will, uh, I, I have to have a three by four matrix really here, right? because a three by four matrix will map a four vector to a three vector. 
which is what I really want if I'm in the homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so I'm saying it's really one, one, one over f zeros here uh, to give me h s h y n h, and then I can divide by h to convert into inhomogeneous coordinates if I want to. So this is a p three to a p two mapping. Okay, and let's see that it's the same as the equation I wrote on the previous slide. You can verify that because what will be h x? H x will be equal to x. What will be h y? H y will be equal to y. And what will be h? H will be equal to z over f. Okay. So now you take z over f and divide this and this by z over f just to just to convert it into inhomogeneous coordinates. So that means x is cap x over z over f, which is really f x over z, and then cap y over z over f, which is really f y over z. So th which is what I wanted. So this is the way to write the camera as a matrix multiplication. Now notice that I could not have done that if I was not using projective mathematics, right? Because there is a division involved, so I could not have written it as a matrix multiplication only, which is a linear, uh, just a multiplication and addition operation. Uh, but but in, in, in our projective mathematics that we have developed so far, it's easy to write a camera as a simple matrix multiplication, as a simple transform of the space. Yes. No, I didn't say that. Technically speaking, you 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 are, you are technically a very good. <laughs> uh, okay, so the question, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the question really is what I'm describing here is a mapping from three space to a two space, from R three to R two, or from P three to P two. Okay, uh, so it's a so there is one one dimension less in this equation on the output side than on the input side. Uh, so he's saying I should be able to do the inverse of this also. Uh, well, not really, right? Because number one, the mapping from 3D to 2D is unique, but the mapping from 2D to 3D will not be unique. There will be a whole lot of solutions on a line which will all map to the same point, okay? The line that I drew in the previous figure. So, so it's not straightforward, right? Uh, how do you see that mathematically? Well, this matrix is not invertible because it's a three by four matrix, so it's singular. Uh, there's a zeros column here. Uh, I, I, I can't just do inverse this and that. If, if I was able to do that, like let's say in the case of a homography, I was able to do that. So, so then I can just change from this side to that side or that side to this side back. But here I can't because it turns out that this is a three by four matrix, uh, which, which is a problem. Okay. Uh, so therefore, you can take a picture, but you can't, but you can't convert it. You can't take a, you, you. So you can map from 3D to 2D, take a picture, and that's easy. You have a camera in your cell phone. You can take a photograph right now. But given the photograph, you can't simply construct the 3D structure of this whole world as a point cloud in 3D. Yeah. Not uniquely, not uniquely. There are many, uh, I mean, it's it, from this figure, from this figure, right? It, it's easy to see and it's also easy to see mathematically. If the matrix is not invertible, there is a, there's a one dimensional space, which is all valid solutions, right? Uh, uh, here, this point maps to this point, but this point also maps to that point. And that point also maps to that point. So each one of them has a different Z and you don't know which one is which one is correct if you were only given the, the image, right? Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is central projection in its simplest form. I've taken a lot of simplification assumptions here which are embedded in what I'm saying. The axes are aligned and uh, I mean, uh, they, they, they are not rotated and, and, the, and the principal point is at the center of the image and so on and so on. There, there are lots of assumptions actually embedded here. So I'm going to, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start relaxing those assumptions one by one by one to get into a more realistic camera model, a camera model that I can work with. Okay, that's the agenda now. Agreed? All right. So, uh, so right now the camera is in the canonical view. Uh, which is centered at the origin with the obstacle axis aligned with the world Z axis, the image axis aligned with X and Y axis of the world. The image X is actually aligned with the world X and the 
and the image Y is aligned with the world Y. Okay, and that yields this camera model for me. The camera model is simply the mathematical equation that maps a 3D world point onto the 2D image point. Okay, uh, because this is a homogeneous system, right, it, written as a P3 to P2 mapping, I can multiply it with any scale factor and it will remain the same, right, because just H will change, but when I divide back by H, it will remain the same. So in a homogeneous system, I can multiply by any scale factor. To, to get rid of this uh, 1 over F as a division, I can just multiply the whole matrix by F. Okay? And then I get F, F1 along the diagonal. And this is slightly more convenient. So you will often see this canonical form camera model written like this. Uh, I can more compactly write it as in matrix form. The the vector x, which is a small vector x, which is a p2 vector, as a multiplication of a 3 by 4 matrix p multiplied by a capital X. Okay? Uh, where p is a 3 by 4 matrix and it maps from p3 to p2. Okay? Uh, p may also be written as you will see this form written somewhere uh, diag of ff1 times i pipe 0. This zero is a bold face zero, so it's a vector of zero. Why? Because I pipe zero is uh, for a for a three by four matrix is one zero 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 one zero 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 one and then zero 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 here. Okay? And then diag of FF1 is a three by three matrix which has on the diagonal F, F, and one. So when you multiply the first three by three block will change and it will come out to be the same matrix. Okay? So that's another uh, like a single line form to to write the camera model in its canonical view. Okay. Now, I'm relaxing some of the assumptions. So I assumed so far in this camera model, I assumed so far that the principal point, what is the principal point? It's the point where the optical axis intersects with the imaging plane. Okay, so it's kind of like the center of your image in some way. Okay, so uh, even though we assume that the imaging plane is infinite, it's not like finite like a film in our case. I mean, any ray can map to the so uh, mathematically we consider it to be infinite in its extent but this is like like the point where the optical axis hits the imaging plane so we we assume that the image in this equation that i just did uh, because the origin is the origin of the imaging plane is aligned with the origin of the world so i assume that the image coordinate origin is exactly at that point okay which is 0 0 for the image the 0, 0 coordinate of the image is exactly at the principal point. Now, that might not be the case in general. Okay? Number one, uh, there are two reasons for that, actually. Number one, because typically when we look at an image, we don't think that the 0, 0 pixel coordinate is in the middle. We think maybe it's at the top left corner or maybe at the bottom right corner as drawn here. Well, we don't often do that, but it could be anywhere, just by convention. You don't have to take it in the middle. Okay? And secondly, even if you impose that condition that I would take it exactly in the middle of the image, when you get the image, it is some pixels by some pixels, right? Let's say it's a thousand by thousand image, okay? Or just for the sake of example, let me say thousand and one by thousand and one image, okay? So the 501 comma 501 pixel should be at the center, okay? But the optical axis is a physical construct. It's a property of where you drew the where you, if you make a physical camera, where is the pinhole? If it has lens, which is the ray that passes undistorted through the lens center? Okay? So, making a physical camera and ensuring that your optical axis will hit exactly at 501, 501 and not at 502, 502 is actually pretty hard because, because each pixel is in, uh, is in micrometers dimension on a typical CCD array in your camera, right? So, so physically, even if you did impose the condition that the principal point offset should be zero, and it should be exactly in the center, it's actually physically difficult to do that. Okay. So in general, in a camera, there will be some physical, uh, some offset of the image coordinate origin from the principal point, either by the construction of the camera itself or by the convention of the axis you are taking, uh, just convenience of the image coordinates. Or both. Okay, so so we call that an offset for principal point. So I need to adjust my model now to to be able to allow that, because currently the model assumed that that the principal point is exactly at zero zero of the origin. 
uh, so of the image. Okay, so so let's say that that principal point offset from the actual principal point to where you took the origin is px and py. That's the getting the principal point is at px and py relative to the image origin. Okay, if that's the case, then I can just add px and py to the imaging coordinates that I get. I can just I can just do that and then everything is taken care of. Okay, because that's an offset vector which will add to every point to get its correct coordinates. Originally, let's say I was saying uh, this is 0, 0 without any offset, so this point is 1, 1, let's say. Okay, now I move the origin here to, uh, to something which means this is really 100, 100 now relative to that origin. So then this point should be 101, 101. So I should really add 100, 100 to my imaging equation, right? It's, uh, it's just that logic. It's a translation into the region. Okay, so I added that. Which means my projection matrix instead of just FF1 on the diagonal will also have a PX, PY. Because if you multiply this, you will realize that this PX, PY adds to the imaging coordinate X and Y. Yeah. Okay, okay. The question is we derived the previous equation, the canonical form equation by similar triangles. There is still similar triangles at play here, so that's okay. But just think of it like this. You did your physical uh, similar triangles in the canonical view and then you really offset the, offset the image coordinates, right? Now offsetting the imaging coordinates is a P2 to P2 translation. And this is how you write a translation, right? You, you have to add in the result. So that's it. Uh, so I will get uh, h of x as f times x plus p x times z, and then I will when I divide this h will become uh, z. So the p x over z divided by that z will cancel, and I will be left with p x. Okay. All right, now this thing, we sometimes also write in, in a factored form like this. I take this three by three block out and instead here just put identity. Uh, the reason we, the, I mean, there are several reasons to do that as we'll see, uh, but one of the thing, things is that it separates out these parameters for me. The, the, these are both F and P, X, P, Y, they are internal camera parameters. They are, they are inherent in the construction of the camera. Okay, so we, we write them out. I mean, nothing to it. You multiply this with this, you'll just get that. Okay, so it's just a different factor for this is a 3 by 3 matrix and this is a 3 by 4 matrix. Okay, the compact way to write this is uh, small x, the vector, uh, the homogeneous vector in P2 space is k times i. So notice I'm using different fonts here and, and, and there is a pattern to this. Uh, this is small bold face, so it's a vector in P2 space. This is a vector in P3 space. <coughs> Even zero I wrote in bold face because that's a vector of zero, zero, zero of appropriate size to balance the multiplications here. Uh, but this typewriter type of font I'm using for matrices. Okay, uh, so where I use this sort of typewriter font, that's a matrix. Where I use the serif font, that's a uh, that's a vector. And if it's a, it's a capital letter, that's a vector in three space. Uh, the other one is a vector in two space. Okay. Uh, so, so this matrix we call K because it's, I mean, it's a special matrix because it's containing all the camera internal parameters, parameters that define your camera. So we separate it out as it's a three by three matrix. I pipe zero is this three by four matrix, and then X is the world point which will map through this mapping into the image coordinates. Yeah. Oh, okay, good question. How do we find this Px and Py or how do we find F for that matter because you have a camera in your pocket, right? What's the focal length of that? Or we will see there are many other parameters. So this topic of how do we actually find these parameters is a topic of camera calibration and we will do it and inshallah you will do it because there's a homework on it. So don't worry, we'll come to it. <laughs> okay. All right, so this K is called the camera intrinsic matrix. 
we call it intrinsic because it's the parameters internal to the camera okay uh, which means it's it's the parameters that are that are really because of the construction of the camera uh, intrinsic term is also used because these parameters will not change if I move the camera from here to here. Uh, whereas we will see that there are some camera extrinsic parameters later which will change when you move the camera. Okay, so that's why it's also the term is used. And this is a three by three matrix of internal camera. Okay, so far so good. I did similar triangles. I derived the basic equation. Then I did one more relaxation on it. I said the principal point does not have to be zero zero. It could be something else. And so I just I added that translation and then after that all I'm doing is writing in it in different and different ways just so that you get comfortable with with the notation we will write. Okay now well let's come to the sort of camera you have in your pocket a CCD camera which is which is in the cell phone okay or or for that matter the surveillance cameras that are scattered all over our campus or now all over our city right <laughs> really. Uh, so uh, one, one shortcoming of the current model compared to these CCD cameras is that we assumed that the, uh, we did not do a unit conversion. We assumed that the same units which are used for the world are used for the image coordinates. Okay? Now in world we use units like centimeters, meters, um, uh, I mean measurement units. Right? Uh, so because I have done similar triangles, the image coordinates will also come out in centimeters. They will not come out in some other unit. But typically we don't do that. Typically we, because images are digitized, they, are, they have a sampling in them. Typically we talk about image coordinates as pixel coordinates. This is pixel 20, 30. So for me to have a realistic model, I need to now convert into pixel coordinates. Okay, from the real world coordinates, in the real world image, yani image coordinates in, in meters or centimeters or micrometers, I want to convert into pixel coordinates. So how do I do that? In, in a CCD camera, the image coordinates are measured in pixels. Uh, some CCD cameras also have actually non-square pixels. Um, uh, by that, uh, in fact, a lot of cameras have that. And by that, I mean that the dimension of like one pixel, one sensor in, in the CCD array is not square, okay? Uh, the, the dimension in the x-axis is actually larger than the dimension in y-axis and so on. Uh, how come? Wh why is that? Well, there is really no good reason to do that as far as the camera geometry is concerned. It's really done for practical reasons because you have to draw wires out of that. Uh, so, so, this, so the pixel cell, the sensor cell measures light intensity, right? If, uh, if uh, in, a, in a CCD, which is a charged coupled device, the charge that accumulates on that sensor is proportional to the amount of exposure to the light, the amount of light intensity falling on it. So if more light falls on it, the charge gets increased, right? And you need to read that. So, uh, so, so you have to run wires through these cells and so on. So for practical purposes, these pixels might not be really square, okay? So, so, so I can do this conversion from real world units of the image to the pixel units. And this is a pure P2 to P2 mapping. Uh, it's it's just happening on the image plane. It has nothing to uh, all those lines and so on that came. They came now. I'm just converting the units here. Okay, so that's done like this. Instead of f and f on the diagonal, I have m x and m i multiplied with f for both terms. And then I have instead of p x p y here, I have x zero y zero. Notice I'm only making change to k. I'm I'm not talking about the rest because the rest was the image and geometry which will remain the same. Okay, where m x is the so m x and m y are scale factors of pixels per unit length. These are the pixels that I need to, con uh, the, the, these are the scale factors that I need to convert centimeters to pixels. So how would I convert centimeters to pixels? I need to know in one centimeter how many pixels there are on my, sen on my sensor. So that's pixels per unit length. So if I, if I multiply, so mx is the number of pixels in the x direction divided by the CCD, size of CCD array in that direction, right? If I have, if I have a CCD array of a thousand pixels, a thousand sensors, and its dimension is let's say two centimeters, then I'll say it's thousand divided by two centimeters. So pixels per unit length. Because see here, this is a length, so this is centimeter. If I have pixels per centimeter, the centimeter and centimeter will cancel and I'll just get pixel units. Okay? 
Uh, and so mx is number of pixels in x direction divided by the size of CCD array in x direction, my is the number of pixels in y direction divided by the size of CCD array in y direction. It's a straightforward scale factor, which will just cancel out the lengths and it will give out to you pixels. Okay, and then what is x0, y0? It's again the principal point converted into pixel coordinates. So x0 is mx multiplied by px, px was in centimeters, now mx is in pixels per centimeter, and y0 is my uh, times py. Okay, so it's just a scale factor conversion that I did so that I can start talking about image coordinates in pixels rather than in centimeters, which is more convenient because that's how we deal with images. Okay, so you are already familiar with this because in your homework you are doing scalings and so on. So it's just like a scaling scaling of the matrix. That's why I have these on the diagram. So it's just like a scaling of the matrix. Yeah. Is it possible to have unequal spacing between Yes, it, it is indeed. And that's why MX and MY are widely different. If it was a perfectly square pixel grid. No, I then, mean that in the same direction that you have unequal spacing between uh, It's possible, but I don't see why you would do that. Uh, so, so that's not how these uh, these CCD array or actually in your in your phone camera most likely you don't have a CCD array you have a CMOS array uh, which is a slightly different technology but uh, but uh, but it's one thing there is no reason to make them unequal that way and secondly it's easy to manufacture in a grid rather than in uh, I mean you know how this manufacturing is done it's done through lithography so you make a you make a grid and then you reduce it. Uh, it's like a reduced photocopy etched onto the silicon wafer. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so now uh, I I have a general camera model in the canonical view. I, I mean I shouldn't say general. It's general because I I did the pixel conversions right. I did the scale factors right. I added the principal point offset. But I'm still in the canonical view. Okay, so the question is, what if I'm not in the canonical view? Uh, uh, canonical view is kind of restrictive. To do that mathematics, you will always have to assume that the world coordinates are fixed on the camera. Okay, now why is that? Uh, let's just re uh, let's just reflect on that for a moment. Why is that a problem? Uh, where is the world origin here in this room? Oh yeah, we can take it anywhere, right? It's not fixed. I mean, the guy who was making this room did not, did not really make the assumption that okay, this will be the origin and this is where x-axis is going and this is where y-axis. He just built this room, right? So now you come into this room and you can, you can, uh, because you are so mathematically inclined, you can't, you can't like come into a room without figuring out where the axes are, right? So, 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 so you try to see this room and you fix an axis somewhere. And then once you fix your axis, you fix your origin and the orientation of the axis, x, y, z, you can assign coordinates to each point in this room. Okay. Now, since the choice of axis is arbitrary, right, it, it could be done anywhere. So why not always fix it on the camera? And then if I fix it on the camera, I wouldn't need these further slides because I already know the mathematics of a camera if the axis is properly fixed on the camera. So why don't we always do that? Okay, okay, good. That's reason number one. The moment I move this camera, so let's say, let's say I'm making a video walking around with my camera. So that camera is moving at every instant and it's also, so it's translating at every instant and it's also maybe changing its orientation at every instant. So if I take this approach that I will only deal with a camera model which has the axis fixed on the camera, then that means that for every image that I'm taking, I have to actually change the world coordinates of every point in this in this system, right? This this corner of the table here has some coordinate, but as I move the camera, this coordinate will change because the axis has changed and so on. So it will be a bit unwieldy to assign coordinates to points in the world. These points are stationary, they're not moving. But, but if I'm moving my axis, they will always be moving relative to that axis which is a bit cumbersome to work with. There is also one other reason. Uh, there is a natural orientation of this room. 
right? This is like a ground plane. These walls are vertical to that ground plane. Uh, think of that corner here. There are three orthogonal axes there. It kind of makes sense. It's easy for me to measure things in this world if I were if I were if my choice of axis was aligned with the principal orientations in this room. Okay. For example, if I do fix the axis at that corner, then that means that and, and this ground plane is xy plane, let's say, then that means that the x and y coordinates of this corner here and the x and y coordinates of this bottom corner here are actually the same. They differ only in the z coordinate, which is actually convenient to work with. If you are if if I give you this homework assignment, uh, I'm not gonna do that because it's it's like uh, it will be a lot of work, but if I give you this homework assignment, measure the coordinates of all the all the corners and lines in this room, right? In fact, they do that in civil engineering. When when I when I went to university, we had to take a surveying and leveling class, and 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 the freshmen were given this task that okay, uh, today the assignment is go measure that building, right? <laughs> and we had to like go carry, and, and the measurements were done by metal chains. Each chain link was a fixed length. And so you had to carry this whole bulky chain and measure it. And I mean, and next week they say, oh, why don't you measure those three buildings? And <laughs> so, so and we had to construct a CAD model of, of, of that building, right? It's called surveying and leveling course in civil engineering. And uh, you see all these people on, on the roads when a new construction is happening with a theodolite and a, and a, and a pole with graduate. But that's what they are doing. They are measuring coordinates of, of, of the world, right? Uh, so, if we were doing that exercise, if I did give you this exercise of measuring the, the coordinates here, it would be very convenient for you to measure them in an axis which is aligned to the, to the kind of orientations of this room. If that was not the case, even along this straight line, the coordinates would arbitrarily change. All three values would be changing, which would be more measurements. Okay? So, so that's why I'm saying it's always not very convenient. Uh, to fix the axis on the camera. Sometimes it is. In, in a lot of problems, we, we do that for simplification, but it depends on problem to problem, okay, of what you are trying to achieve from your camera model. Like in a self-driving car, it makes a lot of sense to have the camera axis, the world axis on the camera and measure everything relative to that because you are doing all your measurements from the image and then certain mathematics will simplify as we'll see. Okay? All right, so, so now I want to do this relaxation. I'm saying, so far, the camera model I've derived is for the case where the camera optical axis is aligned with the word Z axis. I, I should really say capital Z here. That's a mistake because I'm using world axis as capital. Uh, so what if this is not the case, okay? So I call this pinhole camera in the general view rather than pinhole camera in the canonical view. Okay, so what is important for you in this problem is to uh, is to get the methodology right because every camera configuration will be slightly different and, 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 and you might have to do. So what's the methodology here? So let's first say that the camera has only translated. It has not rotated just for simplification. Okay. So initially the camera was in the canonical view which means the origin of the world and the origin of the uh, I mean the origin of the world was at the pinhole okay, with the z-axis in line and so on and now I've just moved the camera from there to some other location and now the camera center is at the vector c okay which is some x0 y0 z0 okay so my claim is this uh, and try to try to understand this logic so if the camera center is at the coordinate c in the world that is this camera is moved to c from the origin i will assume that initially the camera was in the canonical view even if i just walked into this room i will assume that initially the camera was there and now i i have it here taking a picture Okay, so the camera has moved C from the origin, then I should move the world point by C inverse. And then I can just use my normal canonical mathematics. Okay, now, 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 let, let, let's understand this. Okay, so, uh, so this is my canonical view. Okay, okay, let me stand in front of that clock. So this is my canonical view. So that clock actually is right on my Z axis. Okay. Uh, this is where I would have been if I were in the canonical view, but actually the camera is not here. Actually the camera is uh, one, two, and, well, two is enough, so two steps to the right, okay? This is where the camera is, which means if I look at my z-axis on the camera, I mean, with respect to the camera, if I look at the optical axis, I will hit some two steps uh, on the right of that clock, 
So the image of the clock will not be at my optical center. Some other point, two steps right of the clock will be at my optical center. Now this is the scenario that I want to build the equation for. Okay, this is the scenario that I want to write as an equation. Okay, but I only know how to write an equation from there, from the canonical view. So what I will do is this. I will say, this is the imaging that I want to do, but I'm actually here. I know this mathematics, so I'll assume that I'll just do this mathematics, but I'll move the whole world two steps to the reverse of what my motion was. Okay, if I move the world two steps to the reverse of what my motion was, then that clock will indeed go somewhere there, and that point which was supposed to be on my, on my optical axis will come in front of me. Right? So that's the strategy we take. We figure out what is the transformation, in general, what is the transformation that the camera has undergone starting from the canonical view, starting from the canonical configuration to wherever it is. What's that transformation? We figure that out. We do the inverse of that transformation because these transformations are invertible. We do the inverse of that transformation and we apply it to all the points in the world that we are interested in imaging. Those points transform and then I think the camera is in the canonical view and I just take the picture which is that matrix that I showed you. Okay? And actually the same holds for rotations. Okay? So, uh, so let's see this. Uh, let's say the camera is here. I'm, I'm just going to do a calculation to convince you that this is correct. Okay, so let's say the camera is here. It's translated 10 units along the x-axis. So it's not in the canonical configuration because the canonical configuration would have been here. Okay, so let's see. This is the point I want to image. 10, 0, 10. That's, that's the world coordinate in front of the camera. Notice the y-axis is 0, which is coming, well, the y-axis is going into the screen here in the right-handed system. But I, I'm just doing it in a, in, uh, in a 2D plane just to make things simpler. Okay, so this is 10 along x, 10 along z, 0 along y. That's the point I want to image. Now this point really should come on the, on the principal point. Uh, I mean on the center of the image, really, right? Because it's exactly on the optical axis. Let's just see if mathematically that's holds correct. So, so mathematically what I do, this is the point, 10, 0, 10, I append it with a 1, okay? And then I have a matrix here, which is, I this is the transformation I'm doing on the world point. It's a new matrix I've inserted in the middle, okay? Uh, so, so the rotation is identity because I did not rotate the camera from the canonical configuration. It's actually at the same rotation as what its canonical configuration was, okay? But I've done a translation of 10, so this is a minus 10. This projector is really bad, so you don't see that <laughs> minus sign, which is actually pretty crucial here. So I did a translation of minus 10, 0, 0, because because the vector is 10, uh, I, I, I actually translated by 10, 0, 0. So I did a transformation here by minus 10, 0, 0, okay? So my claim is that this should correct this point so that it comes actually in the canonical configuration. And then this is the imaging matrix for the canonical configuration. I just wrote the simple one. I didn't put px, py, and all those additions. I just put the first simple one just to see this, okay? Is that clear? And then, and then let's see what answer we get. So, so this times this actually comes out to be this, and then this times this actually comes out to be 0, 0, 010, which is actually a scale factor of 0, 0, 001, which means, yes, indeed, this point mapped in this middle of the image. I didn't have any principal of point offset, so the, the middle of the image is 0, 0 in this case. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. That's why I have a scale factor. So the world is in meters and the image is in pixels. In this case, I just used the, the meters to meters mapping, so I didn't do that MX, MY here, just for simplification because I went. So, so the image units are also in meters. But in general, the world is in meters, the image is in pixels. Okay. All right, so this tells me my, it, it's a simple, uh, uh, simple example to show that my strategy is correct. I will apply the inverse of the transformation, thinking about the camera has undergone a transformation from the canonical view to some place, I will do the inverse of that transformation, apply it to the world point, and then do my imaging equation. And then that should be okay. Yes? Sorry? No, we are not. Oh, after the transformation has happened. Yes, we, that's what we should do. Two 
transfer. Yeah, I just need one additional transfer. It, it is very similar. This matrix is exactly the same. I just need one additional transformation to correct for the camera motion. No, because because I walked into this room and my camera is not at the origin. Uh, if I impose this restriction on the world, I, I announce it at NAMS, nobody will take a photograph except from the origin and I have fixed it now. <laughs> right? Then you will always get the same photograph because you can't rotate the camera, you can't translate the camera. Okay, so that's the notion. Yes, you can fix it. Like I said, in certain problems, you can fix the camera at the origin. You can assume the origin to be at the camera. You can assume canonical configuration, but that's quite restrictive in, in certain problems. If you want to deal with world coordinates in their natural orientation, in their natural configuration, then you have to assume that the camera is not at the origin in general. Yeah. So you first correct it and then do it. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> like. Like the, like the laborer who made this room did not fix an origin while putting the bricks, right? Uh, when we ask somebody to take a photograph, we, that person doesn't care about where you would think the origin is, right? So, does that answer your question or no? Yeah. 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 So this number is a continuous number. It can change. Whatever the vector offset is, that vector, the inverse of that vector, you'll write here, right? And that's that doesn't have to be pixels. It could be eleven point three. Uh, it's a it's a real uh, it's a real world transformation matrix. In fact, this is exactly what we were discussing in the last lecture. It's a it's a three D to three D transformation matrix. Okay. And I'm applying it to a 3D point to get another 3D point and then I'm just simulating. Yeah. So when the camera is taking a photo, does it like pivot or turn like 9 centimeters? Pivot? Is it pivoting or is it a second one? Is it pivoting or is it a second one? Or is it a second one? Or is it the world origin? So the world origin is your choice as a computer vision engineer. The world origin really does not exist. It's your choice as a computer vision engineer. It's only a construct of when you want to do this mathematics. Like I'm saying, if somebody walks into this room, they wouldn't care less of where the world origin is. Okay. From next class, we will fix an origin and I'll, I'll, I'll send you coordinates of seats and then you will only sit on that seat. When you come into the room, you have to figure out, right? <laughs> it is actually done, right? Uh, when you have an exam in a large hall, uh, you might have directions of saying sit on row number A, column number 1, right? Uh, I used to do that when we had the exam for CS 100, we would, we would give out coordinates like that. That is a coordinate system actually, because the seats are arranged in a grid or something close to a grid. So sometimes we do work with coordinate systems even in our life, but, but generally we just walk around without worrying about the coordinate system. Okay, so what if there is also a rotation? So, so I'm just going to generalize the same strategy yeah, to come up with a general camera model. So in general, I would assume that the camera center is at a, so the camera is really at a rotation of, I, I, from the canonical view, I say it's a rotation of R transpose, the inverse of R. I'm, I'm just using that so that I don't have to deal with transposes later because I'll have to invert it. Okay, so I'm saying wherever is the camera in the world, it really was in the canonical view to begin with and then it underwent some rotation about origin which I call R transpose and then it moved to wherever it was in the world which is C. Okay, So, so that's in general my, my notion. This is the world axis. The camera was originally here. I would assume, I would imagine that the camera was originally here. It first rotated by some R transpose. So that's your R transpose and then I mean I really shouldn't have drawn an arrow like this for our transpose because when, when you rotate, the origin remains the same. So it really rotated into the correct orientation and then it moved by C into the world somewhere. Okay? And I'm just going to do the strategy that I just did. I'm just going to do undo that transformation to the world point and then image it just like it was in the canonical view. 
So that's that's what it is, right? This is your camera matrix in general. Uh, I mean, the, the canonical form camera matrix that we came up with. So this is where the, the click happens, the picture happens. Okay, the mapping from 3D to 2D happens because it's a it's a three by four matrix. Okay, this is your world point. In between, I inserted a transformation. Now I inserted the inverse of that transformation. Now that transformation was really that transformation was really, I first rotated by R transpose and then I did a translation by C. Uh, consider this as a matrix, I'm, I'm not writing a vector, okay? So I did a translation by C. So I'm just going to invert the whole thing. A, B inverse is B inverse, A inverse, which means I will get R and then C inverse like this, which is what I'm writing here. This is C inverse, the inverse of the translation C, and then this is R inverse, but R was originally R transpose, so this is R transpose transpose, which is just R. So in general, I have to, this, this is the general canonical view, uh, general, general view camera transform. In general, I will figure out what is the rotation done by the camera and what is the translation done by the camera to, to reach where it is actually from the origin. I will invert that transformation, apply that to point X and then take the canonical view transform okay it's very clear to keep this in mind because it's uh, it can get confusing when you are working on real problems yeah uh, okay so the question is uh, for this to work i have to know where the origin is because if the origin changes everything would change and and that's true you fix the origin and then you plug in this matrix x right uh, when we when we have an aircraft flying, let's say, uh, imaging something, wh where is the origin? We generally report the coordinates of world coordinates in latitude, longitude, and height, right? And that means the origin is at the center of the world, and then latitude, longitude are degrees going from there. So that gives me a coordinate multiplied by the Earth radius and so on. So it gives me a coordinate on the surface, and then there is height, right? So you always work as soon as, uh, it's not even a problem of the camera. As soon as you say this point is at XYZ location, that means there is an origin fixed. So you can't even talk about a point unless an origin is fixed, right? So, uh, so it's not a problem of the camera, it's a problem of writing coordinates in, in, as a vector. And indeed, if the origin changes, like we did here, we are actually moving the origin by this transformation. So if the origin changes, you have to insert appropriate transformation matrices to do that. And that's part of the reason why we spent six lectures in this course talking about transformations because because really otherwise this would be confusing. Any questions here? Yeah, but that's something I said in the beginning of the lecture. We are going to assume that every camera is a pinhole camera. And then, and then a pinhole camera, everything is in focus. And the purpose of the lens is also actually to keep, every, to keep everything in focus in a way, wherever you are imaging. So the purpose of the lens is actually to make a pinhole camera with, with a, uh, even though your camera has an aperture which is bigger than a pinhole. Okay? So, uh, so, so we are going to treat only pinhole cameras and then in a pinhole camera there is no problem of, we don't even have to talk about focus. Why, why does non-focus or blurring happen? It happens because your pinhole is like big. I mean it's not a pinhole now, it's like a, what should we say, a straw hole. <laughs> or, or some like bigger hole, right? So. Uh, so in this case, what will happen is that if I have an object here, notice that this, this ray can map here, but it can also map here, okay? Which means at this point, I will be getting light from, so, I will be getting light from here as well as here at this point, which will, which is what causes the blur. And that's why you actually put a lens here to, to correct for that blur. You, you distort the rays so that at one point in the film, you only get light from one point in the world. Okay. Uh, it does, actually, if you want to model this lens, there will be a different camera model, and we talked about that in physics. In fact, 
in fact the camera the lens assembly in an SLR camera might have like six lenses or eight lenses it's a very comp and so the camera models for those are also very complicated and there's a whole branch of optics where you study those we're just going to ignore that uh, I, I have a book in, 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 in somewhere in my stack of books uh, I have a book which is about this thick which is on lens equations right only lens equations because there are so many different types of lenses that you can make but I never read that book, so I just ignored it. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe we do need to, if we, are, if we are making a very precise camera, like, like if you are designing Hubble's Space Telescope, you will need to know a very precise camera model. Uh, but but for, for our work, we just ignored it. Okay, so the pinhole camera in general view. This is the canonical view pinhole camera. Like I said in the last lecture, you should start, you should make this mental shift that you start thinking of camera as a matrix rather than, rather than as a physical device. When next time somebody says camera, in your mind you should not think of like, like a device you can buy. As soon as somebody says, I need a camera, you write out an equation, a matrix for that, right? This is what a camera is. It's a, what is a camera? It's a 3 by 4 matrix, that's it. <laughs> there's, no, there's no other way about it, okay? And you just have a uh, you just have a physical device that's a manifestation of a three by four mapping. <laughs> you you just you just you just constructed it and bought it and spent an awful lot of money on it, but it's just a three by four matrix. That's it. Okay. So this is that that camera in the canonical configuration. Notice that that's why I used this factorization before because this is an identity three by four transform. It's a three by three identity, which is the multiplicative part for rotation, and it's zeros here. Okay. As opposed to, now I can make a direct contrast, as opposed to the general view, this intrinsic matrix remains the same, but here I have a rotation and a translation. Uh, this translation, by the way, because it's on the other side, so it's not just C1, C2, C3, which is the camera offsets, it's actually R times C. Uh, you have to do them. If you pre-multiply a translation, you can directly read off the translations. It's also a problem in your homework. But if you post-multiply a translation, it's actually that multiplication times the translation that comes in that vector. Okay. So uh, I write this general model as k r pi t x, or I can factor out the r and say k r i i pi minus c. Okay. Now, now this c is the actual camera offset. But when r multiplies with it, it becomes t. Okay, so just to get the notation right, small x is the image point, cap x is the world point, k is a 3 by 3 matrix of internal camera parameters that, that contains the principal point offset, the focal length, the mx and the y, my scale factors for pixel, uh, for world to pixel conversion, world coordinate to pixel coordinate conversion. That's all inside k. Okay, actually there is an error here. This should have been x0, y0. Because, well, Okay, no, this is written in world coordinates, so it's okay. But what I really should have written here is MXF, MYF, and X0, Y0. Okay, uh, here you would understand if I've written it like this, then these are also in centimeters, not in pixels. Okay, and then R pi T is a 3 by 4 matrix of external camera parameters. These are called extrinsic parameters because these are parameters of camera position. Okay. Uh, R is the rotation needed to align the camera to the world axis because it's the inverse of R transpose which was the world axis going to the camera and then T is the translation needed to bring the camera to the world origin and T is really equal to minus RC where C is the vector of the camera center. Okay? So that's what a camera is, right? We, we, we covered the whole, uh, uh, the whole camera model. Any any questions? Yeah. In general, uh, f x uh, these two f's are not equal. Uh, why is that? F x and f y. We see that they are not equal. Uh, 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 in 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 general, the f actually the the real world measurement f is often equal, but when I multiply it with m x and m y, that that yields let's say an f prime x, which is m x times f and f prime y and those are not equal right uh, so if you are doing ca camera calibration using a toolkit you will get two focal lengths from it because because the image coordinates were provided in pixels so that mx and my have already multiplied in there and then your focal lengths are not equal actually okay 
uh, if it was a perfect pinhole camera and you were still keeping the image measurements in centimeters let's say then f should have been equal because a light ray traveling this way has similar characteristics to a light ray traveling that way they are both straight lines okay but it's actually because of the ccd or the sensor which is constructed in a unequal way the pixels are not square that that you get different scale factors any other question okay good so um, uh, remember the announcements uh, we we will not have a class on Tuesday because Lamas is now off on Tuesday. Uh, we will have a class next week, inshallah, on Wednesday and Thursday. We will not make up that class on Saturday because, uh, which is what Lamas has announced, that the makeup for Tuesday class is on Saturday. But I already had travel plans for Saturday. Uh, they just did this change. So, uh, so I'll make up at some later date, inshallah. And the homework is due today at 5. You have to submit a PDF on LMS. All right. Okay. Sorry. Yes, we have a class tomorrow, but there is no quiz tomorrow. The quiz is moved to after eight, so you have some time to prepare. Um, unless you were spending, you were thinking of having eat vacation, but obviously that's not the case. You'll be studying this material. <laughs> okay. You're doing